Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar on branding, marketing, and differentiation in the DIY social media era. What's not enough? What's too much? And what's just right? My name is uh, Jordan Metzel, and it's a pleasure to see you all from here in New York. We have a really exciting program tonight, and as we uh, start on here, I'm going to give some ground rules. First of all, um, just hop right into the uh, chat and tell us who you are and where you are joining us from. Like to kind of read out some uh, as we get everybody on here. Just let us know who you are and where you're joining us from, just so we can see who is here. Um, do not be shy. Just hop right in there and, and uh, right in the chat. Tell us who you are and where you're joining us from. We have Jess joining from up in uh, Boston area. Dr. Jess, good to see you. Go ahead and type your name right in there so we'll say hello to you. We have Dr. Daphne Scott joining from right here in New York City, a great colleague. Don't be shy. We have uh, Deb joining from Tampa and Kaylee from Salt Lake. And Muhammad is joining from Michigan and Mark from out in the great state of Missouri underneath the arch in St. Louis and Sarah from up in Boston Children's in Boston. Go ahead and type your name right in there. Do not be shy. We have Spencer from Chicago and Carl from Poughkeepsie and Tariq from Panama City and Jason from Long Island. Sonal is from Modesto, California and Rick from Westport and Robin from Chicago and Anter from Brooklyn. Um, and uh, Megayas, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna pronounce that well, but Los Angeles, happy to see you. And Marsha from Norfolk and Yvonne from Minneapolis and Ed from Grand Rapids, Michigan. So well, nice to see as people just go ahead and hey, Michelle Abutz, haven't talked to you in a while. Hope you're doing great up in Maine. Um, and uh, it's just great to see people joining in from all over the place. And obviously the last few years have been rough, but uh, it's great to be able to get people together um, as we kind of join in to talk about this very interesting topic tonight. So I'm gonna hop right in here um, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. This program is uh, put forth tonight um, by uh, the AMSSM and we really appreciate them and the Sports Economics Committee, which uh, asked us to put forth a program on these issues around branding, marketing, and how to navigate this in today's day and age. Um, I'll introduce our panelists in just a quick second. I just wanna start by talking a little bit about tonight's topic. Um, this is a topic which affects all of us. And I guess I would start by saying, if we're not doing it, somebody else is doing it. And so we wanna think about how we can do it well, how we can do it appropriately, how we can do it in a way that feels good enough to us and to others while at the same time getting good information out there because there's a lot of information and information is not going anywhere. So we wanna try and I think do the best job we can in terms of controlling the discussion. All right, so I first will tell you that social media is here to stay. Um, this is a look at social media platforms by age group in the United States. And you can see um, in the blue 18 to 24, 25 to 29, 30 to 50, 50 to 65, and 65 plus, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Um, you can see that uh, how these different platforms are used and the age demo around them and who's kind of interacting. I think this is particularly interesting. Next, which is looking at the numbers of people using these platforms and the tremendous growth of people using these platforms. So this looks at 2004 to 2018, looking at the growth of the different platforms and just look at these skyrocketing numbers, over 2 billion users of Facebook, almost 2 billion users of YouTube, um, over a billion users of Instagram. Um, so just amazing numbers of people and, and amazing amounts of information. Some of it good, some of it bad, but all of it out there. So uh, being part of this discussion, I guess I'm gonna tell you, I think is very important. Um, how we learn how to do that, how we navigate that is part of what we're gonna talk about tonight. But I would start by saying, I think it's a very important thing to be part of this discussion when you just look at the numbers of people who are getting and using this information in today's world. Now, if we look at uh, kind of the age old family doctor, I put in uh, Google family doctor old timer, and this is the picture I got. So if you look at the kind of one doctor uh, one patient, one mom uh, from, this looks like kind of probably Victorian England or something. Um, you know, still the most important part of being a doctor is what happens in the exam room. So you can be 
the best information disseminator. You can have great social media, whatever, branding. If you don't do a good job and take care of your patients, you're, it's not going to work at all for you. So I think all the stuff we're talking about is a part of what it means to be a good and effective doctor, um, but it certainly doesn't replace any of that. Um, but we certainly are going to talk about the growth of branding, the growth of, of social media as, as a vehicle for that, the growth of distribution of information, the growth of disseminating that information, and growth of the risks and benefits from branding. It's not only good, there's certainly some risk involved in this, and we're going to talk about some of that tonight, because if this was the old generation of this, this kind of cool looking guy with the aviators and the stethoscope around his neck may be the new and, you know, we can't be the old time and we certainly don't want to be this thing, but, you know, where are we in this whole world and how do we, how do we navigate that? So tonight's panel is all about thinking about some of these issues. And I'm just really happy to have an all-star lineup of uh, speakers. And we're going to talk about some of those speakers uh, really quickly. So starting here on the left, we have John Engelhart and John is the uh, senior vice president here at HSS. Chief of Communications and Marketing. He's been here at HSS for eight years. And John is just an amazing resource in thinking about all things branding. We're going to talk to him about uh, how branding works in our world and how he's kind of overseen the growth of these issues from an academic institution like ours. Um, next, we have Elliot Hugh. And Elliot is a sports medicine physician at the Naval Hospital out Camp Pendleton, California. He's been in that role for about four years and also has an MBA. Elliot has a particular interest in these topics around branding, marketing, um, and uh, actually Elliot was instrumental in putting this panel together and helping us uh, get this off the ground. And we really appreciate his efforts and his insights we'll hear from tonight. Next we have, I'm just gonna say the godfather. We have uh, Sri um, Srivanasan. Sri is basically a scholar in digital communications based here in New York. He is the inaugural Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation and Audience Engagement at Stony Brook. Um, he was formerly uh, one of the country's first professors in social media at the Columbia Journalism School, where he uh, was a professor for more than 20 years. And he's going to be starting um, this fall um, in mass communication at Arizona State University, working on global media training. Um, in addition to all that, he was the chief digital officer of New York City, the city of New York and also was um, the chief digital officer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So he has tremendous experience in all of these topics around uh, audience engagement, et cetera. And then last but definitely not least, we have the amazing Karen Sutton. Karen is an orthopedic surgeon here at HSS, team physician for US Ski and Snowboard and US Lacrosse, um, and also has been quite uh, a, a, an early adopter and adapter of social media in disseminating educational information and has been terrific on the orthopedic surgery side of this discussion. So we're so appreciative of Karen's involvement as well. All right, so before we start tonight, we're gonna to open up to some polling and uh, I want everybody to vote. Um, you're gonna vote once um, or more than once if you can. Um, and let's go ahead and launch our poll tonight. And uh, here we go. So I want everybody to vote here. And I want you, first of all, to say, how would you describe your role in medicine? Are you a trainee, an attending physician, or other? Number two, how would you describe your gut feeling about self-branding for physicians or healthcare professionals? Do you love it? Are you okay with it if it's done well? Or is there no role for branding oneself in medicine? Number three, go ahead and keep voting, everybody. Um, how do you think cultural norms have changed in the past 10 years uh, for branding? Branding has become more acceptable. Branding has become less acceptable uh, or uh, there's been no change at all. And uh, in the next 10 years, healthcare care professionals will be more involved with self-branding, less involved with self-branding or about the same as today. Uh, my gut feeling about branding is I do it, but I don't like to talk about it. I don't do it and I don't like to talk about it. I do it and I like to talk about it. <laughs> and Number six is, I'm worried if I'm seen as promotional, I'll be viewed as negatively in medicine. And I feel like my academic institution has my best interest at heart with respect to promotion and branding. Um, and this is an interesting set of questions. I think get at some of the topics we're going to talk about. 
We're going to close polling here in a few minutes. So go right ahead and uh, keep voting. Three writes, um, it's a great poll. I'm sorry, we can't vote. I thought you can. You, I didn't, sorry about that, Sri. Um, all right. Next time you can vote. All right, we're going to close down voting in five, four, get those votes in, three, two, one. So let's have a look at these results. Um, just to kind of uh, start looking. How would you describe your role in medicine? So we have about 60% attendings, about a third trainees. Um, how would you describe your gut feeling about self-branding? I'm okay with it if it's done well. Um, nobody said there's no role. I guess that's why you turned into tonight's webinar. So that's good. Do you think culture and norms have changed in the past 10 years? And it's certainly become 96% say it's become more acceptable. In the next 10 years, healthcare professionals will become much more involved with branding, which I think as well. My gut feeling about branding, this is interesting. I do it, but I don't like to talk about it. About half of you, I do it. I don't do it. And I don't like to talk about it. About a third of you, I do it. And I like to talk about it about 20%. So that's an interesting split. Um, I'm worried I'll be seen as a promotional and I'll be viewed negatively in medicine. That's almost 70%. So there's definitely a stigma, which we can talk about during our questions. And then finally, I feel like my academic institution has my best interest at heart with respect to promotion and branding. And uh, that's about a 50-50 split. So I think those are all interesting ways to start thinking about tonight's um, discussion. And with that, we're gonna jump right into our first, we're gonna chat with each of our panelists for a second here. And I'm going to start with our good friend, John Engelhart. So John, go ahead and take yourself off mute. And um, thank you so much for being part of tonight's program. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for making time this evening. So John, as the chief branding officer uh, for HSS, tell us a little bit about what that means for, for your role and also for an academic institution like ours. Well, I think the... Um, um, uh, that role is really about um, uh, differentiating um, and enabling the provision of medical care and members of the medical staff. And I think uh, that was, I agree with Sri, that was a great pull. And I would actually go back and, and kind of double click on the sixth um, uh, question in that, because I think it raises a really important point. I think there is an important distinction between promotion and branding. Promotion tends to be uh, really about self-interest. And branding is really a service to consumers. And that's really, really, really important. And, but there's a very, very important distinction between what is done and how it's done. And so uh, in what we do at HSS and, and the, the role of the group that I'm part of is, is not promotion, but rather branding. And branding is really a service to consumers. And it's never been more important than it is today in healthcare because choice happened. Consumers, it's really, really hard to be a consumer of healthcare these days. There are so many choices, so many options. And I think for those of us in this group here, if you imagine it like a cereal aisle, look down the cereal aisle. How did that happen? Hundreds of different options. And that's how consumers view it. It's completely overwhelming. So the role of branding, role, role of promotion is, okay, we'll give you 25 cents off or whatever, or you get a free Batman sticker inside. But the role of branding is really, uh, and as we practice it at, at HSS, is about first and foremost, differentiating the community of, of providers that are there, which is having a worldview and a position that is distinct from others. And that's a signal to consumers for what you stand for. What can I expect when I come, uh, when I come there? And good branding and good differentiation begins with detective work. So it's not understanding so much what you wanna do, but understanding what it is that's important to consumers. And how can you most valuably serve the interests of consumers? So that's what we do in, in that's kind of the, the first point of, of, um, of, of branding, first principle of branding at HSS. And we try to bring a lot of insight to that. And, and that's a, you know, we won't go down that path. The second, the second part of the role is, is of aggregation. And it's aggregating attention. It's aggregating audience. 
It's aggregating engagement in all different ways, direct and indirect. And obviously it's about aggregating and simplifying the market as a service to consumers. So consumers can, can know what to expect and they can, it can be easier for them to find you in that really, really crowded cereal aisle, so to speak. So we do that in lots of different ways. A lot of it is, is about content, but it, it's, it's about substance and, and information and engagement with consumers versus something that is promotional. And promotional promotion doesn't work with most consumers these days. Consumers are, are increasingly sophisticated and, and appropriately skeptical and cynical. So we try to bring all of that to, to distinguishing and, and living up to the, 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 the quality and the caliber of, of the medical care. It's a great answer. Uh, now, my question around that is how much do you engage physicians in this piece? I, I was particularly interested in the last question I asked, which is, do you feel like your academic institution is doing a good job branding you? And only about half the people thought they were. Yeah. Um, so how do you engage medical professionals in that experience? And for people who don't, about half the people on this webinar felt like they were not being well represented, what advice would you give to them? Well, I think um, uh, the first the answer to the first part of that question is, is we can never do enough. And, and obviously at any academic medical institution um, and including obviously HSS, the, 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 the providers, the physicians are, are, are the talent. I mean, that's, that's why we exist. And, and it's not just for the purposes of, of branding or, or advocating or aggregating, but also there's so much insight and learning and guidance. And so, so that when at HSS, we call it shared leadership. It is more an aspiration than a, than a real practice, but it's super important. And so we, 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 we don't do enough of it. There's all kinds of practical uh, hurdles and challenges to that. Um, there are, are some members of the medical staff that are more um, oriented toward that and, and, um, and engaged in that. And by the way, it's not just about them liking or wanting to do what we want. We, we, our fuel is in large part critical feedback. Um, and and constructive engagement. So that so that um, um, uh, that that's that's kind of where we are with that at HSS. And I think probably on the whole, um, a, a a third of the medical staff are actively engaged in one form or another in in um, in, in branding and marketing activity. In terms of what to do if you don't think um, that um, that you're getting the level of support and and I, I say this also to to surely the the HSS colleagues um, who um, uh, who gave that response to the survey um, I think it is um, uh, uh, about engagement and and I think speaking with your um, uh, your branding colleagues whatever form they may take in your institution and and starting with just saying look you know how do you measure success what, what, what should I expect from you? And, and um, what are my opportunities to engage in your process? Yep. And, and, and be, be demanding and, and, and push that envelope because together we, we will make it better. That, that's great. Uh, lastly, John, um, tell me a little bit about kind of the rise of social media vis-a-vis -vis this discussion, because I feel like everything you say sounds great, except for everybody in the palm of their hand, can be a quote unquote brander slash promoter um, with their own voice. And so how do you how do you how do you walk that line? That'll be a good segue into Sri. Well I think look and and, and Sri is the godfather and the master. I think you know from from my humble perspective, I think um, social media is is a boon to communication. It carries with it more responsibility and more risk as well as more opportunity than is generally understood. And it is, um, as you were alluding to before, um, uh, the, the, the veil of anonymity is, is, is a factor in that. And, and something that we deal with um, every single day is people uh, abusing the veil of anonymity and protecting members of the medical staff from that. So it's, it's wonderful. And I think it brings a level of, of both transparency and accountability. To the brand, to, to the physician institution consumer brand relationship. 
And by the way, as you listen in, everybody, please feel free in the questions, just write your questions out in a very thoughtful manner. And I will get to those when we get to the Q&A. John, thank you. I'm going to put you on, on mute. Great answers. And I'm going to pull up Sri here. If you heard my intro for Sri at the beginning, um, Sri um, is such a terrific resource. We're so appreciative of him joining us. Sri, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. And uh, speak your branding, you know, the Hospital for Special Surgery shows you the value of international branding. My father, who needed orthopedic surgery while he was living in Kenya, did all he could to get to <laughs> the east side of Manhattan. Uh, and this is 35 years ago. It just tells you, you know, I think people in medicine are especially attuned to the value of high quality and expertise. I always say that on social media expertise works, but as it does in the kind of the rest of the uh, marketing world as well. And um, I, my experience with uh, medicine and helping people who are doctors, physicians, public health folks, uh, I have watched this, this change. You know, those, the stats that you're showing today are very different from when, for example, I organized the first social media day for Columbia's uh, medical center, CUMC, in Uptown uh, New York, where we were Manhattan, where we were trying to get doctors to get on LinkedIn, get on Twitter, get on Instagram, and uh, this was 2012, and it was uh, there was a lot of curiosity, but also a lot of fear, and I think that has changed. The other thing that's changed is the pandemic itself uh, has caused so many different ways in which people have used social and digital media, but our uh, I think our friends in the medical business in, 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 uh, in any healthcare uh, role have realized that they're the value of good communication. And the reason we're in the third year of this pandemic is in part because there's been so much bad communication at various levels, various institutions, various organizations. And I've worked with and interviewed hundreds of physicians and public health folks during uh, the uh, during this period, also helped uh, create podcasts for doctors during this period, and work with the World Health Organization uh, and watched what they're doing. Uh, the International Red Cross, for example, has a whole team doing TikTok now. And when you ask them, they say it makes such a difference in their meeting their goals of getting uh, their social media uh, messaging out there. So it's a fascinating time. And I'm so uh, pleased to be with all of you to talk about this today. It's a, it's a fascinating perspective on this, Sri. I, I, I'd love to kind of walk you back just for a second to the early, early days of social media and physician involvement, particularly because, as you saw in the question I asked, about two-thirds of people have a negative connotation associated with, quote-unquote, promotion, which is, you know, can be viewed as information dissemination. So I think in the medical community, there is a, a, a there's a skepticism around putting yourself forward, but if you're doing social media, you're putting yourself forward in some way. So how do, talk about the growth of that and how you've seen that evolve and, and where you kind of see that now and maybe where it's heading. Sure. I talk about this with doctors all the time. Uh, one of the things we have observed is that and you said this, Jordan, that people are doing this anyway. And there are characters and charlatans out there who uh, uh, use social media who are maybe have some kind of medical training or say they have medical training and dominate the conversation. So as a consumer of healthcare, I want you folks, the best uh, people who the, who the experts, the folks who know this stuff really well to step up and, and talk to us and share your information. We want that. I've been working with folks even during the days of blogging and encouraging folks to have a blog, have a website even. Was, you know, these are all things that they didn't want to do. It is changing. There is a negative, uh, at the same time, as you said, there is a negative connotation to some of this, but we have to understand the world that we're living in now. You know, the Washington Post has three full-time people doing TikTok because they know this is a way not just to reach kids, as some people say dismissively, but to get their messaging, uh, their audience, build that uh, relationship with them. And we need people who are sharing the best, most accurate, trustworthy information to be out there. And we want you all to do it. That's interesting. Now, Sri, what about kind of the, I know you're not a lawyer, but, but the kind of the liability issues around medical information. We're really cautious about that. And doctors are in a particularly vulnerable position anyway. 
Um, tell, talk to me about liability vis-a-vis -vis some of these issues. Sure. And in, in, in interesting you brought up uh, lawyers because in 2009, I did a series of workshops with legal, uh, uh, with legal associations, including the law, Legal Marketing Association, where the message in law firms was no social media. Uh, because of some of the things you talked about in terms of exposure and things in the legal side. Within five years, lawyers and, and big law firms are hiring social media managers and encouraging folks within guardrails, within guidelines to do this. When I worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they, we had our own sets of issues, as you can imagine, about safety and security and uh, provenance of artwork and all of that that meant we have to be very careful of what's shared. So I'm a big believer that with training and the right guardrails, folks who are in areas where they have to be careful, including Wall Street, by the way, there was no social media. Now all the Wall Street firms do it within reason. And that's one of the ways that you should think about it as well. If you're uncomfortable, think about what are the guardrails and what are the guidelines that will make it possible and comfortable for you to do it. I have just a couple of things that I can show you that can help you kind of think about this or show you how I think about this. One is this chart from a longer presentation that I'll, I'll stick the link in the chat, uh, but this idea of what I call the two footprints. But we all have two footprints with the physical footprint of who, who knows us and our work in our personal circles and the bigger digital footprint and how we're perceived, understood online. And if they're not in balance, you are leaving opportunities, influence and resources on the table. And that's one of the ways I think about this. So I encourage all of you to think about your footprint and that digital footprint and how you can make it work. You know, we, we had the wonderful list of folks who are coming in from all over. And there's an updated version of the, of the chart that Jordan had showed us. It's still not all the way. It doesn't take us to today, but you can see how the numbers are changing and the directionality of all of this. And you see some platforms that might surprise you that Twitter is so low. Right? It's still 380 million, but it punches above its weight because there are so many uh, celebrities and politicians and others on there. And then you see uh, Instagram and other, other platforms is here as well. So I'll send this in, in the chat. And one last thing is look at this uh, set of QR codes here. It shows you how many different ways people are connecting, sharing, un trying to understand the, the marketplace of information. You don't have to be on all of these platforms. If you're a physician, pick one or two and please engage because we need quality information from quality folks. I love you. We can bend most three uh, little funds there. Sri, back up a couple spot slides. I have one quick question on that, that, uh, that right there. So in my office, if I see somebody, I, you know, they have a knee problem, I diagnose it, I help fix it, they come back in, they see me six weeks later, their knee feels great. They go back to running. They're like, hey, listen, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, everyone, most people on this webinar know when somebody knows in their physical space or in their patient care, or even with their colleagues, like, you know, they're, if they get that. How do you understand if your digital footprint is successful, unsuccessful, how you're perceived? Give us some cues on that. Because I think it's very interesting. I know the footprint in person. I don't know how to Kind of get a sense of my how my digital footprint is perceived. Sure, uh, and that's a really good question and something that I want everybody to think about. How are you perceived out there? And there are obviously ways, including Google searches and audit of what you're doing. Uh, another term you may have heard is digital exhaust, like you're sending out things all the time. Which of it is you know what of it is good and what of it is problematic? And so uh, doing an audit is a good way to start, and then just thinking about what are the ways in which we can uh, improve what we're putting out there. And again, the daily work that you do is of such high quality that people want to understand it and they'll benefit from each of you participating uh, as uh, Dr. Metzl does, as uh, Dr. Sutton does in this area. That's such great information. Ladies and gentlemen, the Godfather. All right, Sri, go on, go on mute there for a second. Please everybody write in some questions um, and we'll get to these in a second. And next, I'm going to pull down um, Dr. Elliot Hugh. Elliot's joining us from out in California. He's part of the sports economics uh, subgroup of AMSSM and um, was responsible for helping us put this together tonight. Elliot um, has a particular interest in this. He has an MBA in addition to his medical degree. And he's looked at some of these issues with respect to kind of value added of 
branding issues. And Elliot, I'm just going to turn this over to you and let you kind of just jump in on the screen share and go ahead and get started. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks a lot, Jordan, uh, for moderating, putting together this awesome, awesome all-star cast. Um, couldn't have done it without you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen a little bit. <clears throat> and so John talked about this a little bit too. You know, what, what got me interested in this was, you know, before or right after I started uh, or I finished fellowship, uh, I joined a private practice. Um, and at that time, you know, private practice was still about 10, 15 years ago. Social media was, you know, kind of booming at, at that point. Um, it's starting to get there and being promotional at that time still kind of sort of had a negative connotation. Um, and so I said, well, you know, what can I do to provide my services and advertise for our group? Um, and, and they said, basically, you have to prove it to us. You have to prove it to your patients. And I said, well, how do you do that? And they're like, well, you know, my patients just tell the other patients and tell the other patients and tell the other patients. I said, well, is there a way to measure that? And, you know, how, how do you know that what, what you're doing is working? And they couldn't, didn't have an answer for me. So this is why, you know, I, I became really interested in this. Um, I did private practice. I joined Kaiser. I uh, was at Yale for, uh, for a little bit of time when uh, Karen was there uh, briefly. Um, and then now I joined the military system. Um, but, you know, I looked at this and I said, number one, you have to really understand what value is. Um, and a lot of people define value differently, but we're going to take a little step back and, and kind of take the big aerial view of what is actually branding uh, in general. <clears throat> so first of all, you know, a lot of what we do is not product. We provide services. Um, so the medical industry provides services. But if you have, let's say, a company like Nike who makes shoes and apparel, they have a product and their brand, that value is embodied within that packaging, within that advertising. But, what, but we can't do that. You know, you can't say that, okay, yeah, the values that you get from us is a packaged doc in a box or a packaged, you know, clinic. You, you, you can only say, and John touched upon this, this is a promise that we can give you. And so the services, they're more of a promise um, than for, for what we can provide. And basically what you're asking for is you're asking for the patients, the consumers to trust us with it. Um, and so how are we, how are we uh, going to, uh, com how are we going to convince them to trust us on these values? <clears throat> so like I said, service brand is essentially a, a promise of what your experience is going to be. Now, I think it's important to look at, well, what is value to an organization and what is value to the consumer? Um, and so a lot of, you know, big organizations, hospital systems, even your clinics, you're going to talk about, well, what is value to the organization? What value does this, you know, does branding or do consumers and your services bring to us? Um, so Michael uh, Porter in 2006 published a book. It's called Redefining Healthcare. Um, and in there, he talks about the value equation. Um, and it's basically quality over cost. What, are, what is quality? Quality is patient-related outcomes. So to the organization, they're using this equation to calculate, well, you know, how can I measure this value and actually put it forth to create some metrics in order for me to say, okay, yeah, this is a value or this is not a value. So the metrics that they typically look at, you know, cost, overhead, utilization of services, reimbursement rates, reimbursement amounts, um, number of new patients uh, that, that are brought into the system, number of adverse effects uh, that you have, uh, treatment outcomes, patient satisfaction scores, um, and also an improved access. So those, just to name a few, those all go into this quality uh, equi uh, value equation. And they say, well, you know, number one, what's your cost? And then what, is, what are your patient related outcomes according to this? And if it's a positive number or a you know, whole number above one, then potentially, yeah, it's, it's great value. If it's lower than one, then it's, it's not really worth it for the organization to, uh, to pr put forth the effort in order to promote you or to brand for you. So I think it's important if you're thinking about branding, if you're thinking about marketing, um, to think about what is actually value to the organization. Now, here's the other side, the consumer side. It is completely different. Um, and this was really, really interesting to me because when I was growing up and going through medical education, I, you know, I grew up in, in and trained in an environment where, you know, the doctor is a doctor, the patient comes to you because you're the doctor and they're supposed to listen to you. But this has completely changed. You know, now patients are saying, I am the customer, I am the consumer. So you really have to think about, well, you know, yeah, if I am the doctor, but I'm not giving the patient what they want, 
in a safe manner in the most appropriate manner, they can go down the street and find somebody else who can do this. Um, and so you really have to think about, well, what, is the, what exactly is the value now from the patient perspective? So what they look at is completely different. It's what they perceive. It's very, very subjective. And there's really no metrics that they have in their minds of what is good value. But in general, what patients look at and consumers look at, well, you know, how's my access? What's my waiting time? What does the clinic look like? You know, is it a shoddy clinic when I go in? Is it, wow, it looks like the Ritz Carlton when I walk in. What's my out-of-pocket cost? How about, you know, how do, my st how do the staff treat me? And what's the comfort and outcomes of your procedures? And, you know, well, let me go on Yelp and see, well, how many five-star reviews do they have? Um, and then also, I like that you bring, brought in uh, social media because what's the ease of technology? A lot of people, ev almost every single person now has a smartphone on their hands and they can all go up to, up to Facebook. They can all go on to Instagram or Yelp or, you know, Twitter and say, well, you know, what have people said about this clinic, this provider? And, you know, they can make their determination from there. So it's, it's interesting because you have to translate now this patient perceived value in terms of the consumer to the, uh, to the uh, organizational side of this. I'm gonna stop sharing and kind of talk about this now. So it's important for the provider to think about, you know, branding opportunities. You know, if I'm going to brand myself in terms of promising a service to the consumer to make my brand bigger, to grow my brand, to, you know, spread my information out there, what is the consumer going to think? So if I improve the ambiance, well, what's my organization going to think? Is it just going to be a waste of money or is it not? So I think translating you know, the patient perceived value into organizational value is a really hard step. It's a difficult step for a lot of providers and a lot of organizations to think about because organizations, they think about organizational value and they leave a lot of, you know, a lot of the patient or the consumer related value to other people like John and Sri to kind of bridge that gap. And then us providers without, you know, a lot of specialized training, you know, I kind of stumbled into this and then got interested in this. That's why I ended up getting my MBA because I was like, you know what? I need somebody to teach me this. Um, and so a lot of us kind of stumble into it and then either we make it or we break it. Um, but I, I think, you know, we need a lot of help in this where you have to be able to say, well, how do I translate, let's say, for example, the improved waiting time or the uh, decreased waiting time into an organizational value. So if I can decrease the waiting time of a patient in the waiting room, that means that I'm gonna improve the access um, of patients. That means I'm going to imp improve my patient satisfaction scores. What if I improve the interpersonal relations and the, how my staff uh, treats the patients and communicates with them? What is that gonna do in terms of organizational value? That might bring in more patients to my office. That might uh, actually you know, say, well, patients might be more satisfied. They might uh, have better treatment outcomes because now they trust in our, uh, our care. You know, those are just some examples of how you can potentially take patient-related values and translating them into organizational values. But one of the most important things uh, that I want to leave everybody with is the idea that in this commodity world, you know, this, you know, you're, as John said, you know, you can go down the street and find seven different people who are doing the same thing. In this competitive, competitive commodity world, unquantified value is unmarketable. And so you have to be able to quantify it. You have to be able to prove it to both the consumer and also the organization in order for you to succeed in, uh, for, in terms of your branding. Otherwise, it's not worth it for anybody. You know, you're just waste, basically wasting your time on all of this. The organization doesn't support you. Patients don't, don't hear you. And then you're left with, hey, yeah, I just wasted you know, eight hours of my time, 12 hours of my time, basically doing nothing. Mm. All great. I mean, it's, it's such an interesting way you've kind of got to this piece of speaking. You're kind of speaking MD and MBA at the same time, which is obviously your training background. But it's very interesting you kind of ended up in that in that role. When I hear you talk, I kind of think about um, maybe some of the challenges of people who may not have as much institutional support as others. So maybe they're in a place where they don't have a anybody affiliated with branding or one person who's handling a whole hospital and they don't have time for a particular person or group. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying is think about this on your own and then talk to people above you who are involved in this. As, as a most effective strategy. John, on the other hand, is saying, let's think about this from the top and then disseminate that information down to, to the folks who can benefit from this. So it's kind of an interesting 
uh, juxtaposition of both roles. Uh, but Elliot, it sounds like you kind of learned about this from the ground up. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I, you know, when I first started in a, in a small private practice, I didn't have somebody like John to help me out. Um, but I had my, you know, my uh, billing specialist. I had my office manager uh, who I made great, great friends with. You know, we had multiple dinners together and said, hey, you know, how do we really promote this? Um, so it's important to have allies. Um, if you're in an organization or a clinic with somebody and, and you're incredibly lucky to have somebody like John and Sri, uh, please use, use that to your advantage. I, 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 if, if I had that, I knew that I know that, you know, 10 years ago, I probably would say, hey, Jim, be knocking on John's door or Shri's door every single, you know, every five minutes or so. Hey, how do we do this? Hey, how do we do this? How do we do this? Sri, I, I see I you're off mute. Sorry. Sri, I see you're off mute. You want to chime in? No, I was just so impressed by the, seeing a medical and business explanation of the things that a lot of us do by instinct and especially a lot of doctors. So thank you for sharing that. I, I was struck especially by uh, how, how to differentiate and how to uh, make sure that you are providing real value. That was very helpful. Thank you. Great. And last but definitely not least, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome a uh, terrific colleague, uh, Dr. Karen Sutton. Karen is an orthopedic surgeon uh, here at HSS. And, um, and Karen, welcome. Ooh. Thanks. I want to be like that person with the sunglasses on. So <laughs> right. I decided to do that. All right. It looks great. Um, very good. All right. You win. Um, <laughs> so uh, Karen, talk a little bit about uh, kind of your experiences. So I think many of us um, on the webinar have been to both uh, our primary sports medicine meetings and to some of the orthopedic surgery meetings. And I will tell you for sure that our crew is a lot nicer to each other than your crew. So in your <laughs> in your world of orthopedic surgery, this has surgery, to stay out later in the night. To, then we maybe, yeah, maybe stuff. so, maybe so. But in your world, um, talk a little bit about your your role of uh, kind of branding. You know, both what's worked for you, what's been challenging um, as an orthopedic surgeon, and how you kind of feel like you've come to a place around all those things uh, over the past number of years. Sure. I think a lot of it is an evolution in progress. And um, also there were some questions in the chat too that we could answer along the way. Um, I started because my brother was in advertising and he said, look, you got to jump on board this. You have to at least come up with a, a small brand and start understanding these platforms. And I felt really silly doing it in the beginning, but he had somebody who was um, starting out as well with his career in advertising. And he partnered me with him to develop a small brand, which, you know, was basically my monogram and initials in certain colors that I like. And then he gave me different platforms to start. Um, I was already on Facebook, but, um, that's not as great in terms of a marketing platform, but then he had me go on Twitter. And initially I just was a little bit anonymous. I would post quotes that I thought were interesting or comment on some events that related to sports medicine, but very, um, not much of an opinion, but just showing facts out there and seeing how people responded to it. I think a lot of what we talk about in social media is seeing the response. You'll get some things that you'll have crickets and you really should keep in mind that there were crickets and other things that you would be surprised, but you know, people commented. Um, my biggest Twitter hit was um, what's the most amazing photograph you took throughout the world and describe something about it. And people, it was like a ton of people. So I think it, it has its ups and downs in the beginning and it, you have to understand the ebbs and flows. And then probably about, I would say close to 10 years ago, um, I started getting involved with some of the groups and one of them was on Facebook, which was a um, group with physician moms. And this goes into some of the kind of ups and downs of social media where Working Mom Magazine published a article about me and tried to understand how I balanced being a mom and a surgeon and other things I do. And I was trying to give a very optimistic view of things and encourage other women going into preferably orthopedic surgery um, that they could be a mom and a surgeon. And so immediately this group was just ridiculing me. Who is this girl? She's fake. There's no way that she's a mom of four and a surgeon. And meanwhile, at the same time, you know, I know we're kind of good on this subject now, but I was pumping milk because I had just delivered my kid. And so I was like quickly scrolling through things. And my friend was like, oh, you're all over Facebook. And I look and she didn't realize it was all negative. 
And then finally somebody chimed in, but you just don't know how it's going to go. And so you have to be ready to take some of the negative with the positive. Um, and then it evolved to actually working with organizations. I, um, you know, getting on Instagram, getting on LinkedIn, and then AOS started working with me and we had a social media committee. And then when I joined HSS around 2017, one of the questions had, had asked, how do you really merge your brand with your hospital's brand? And I think that's where John has really been a great influence and to be able to have a relationship with your chief marketing officer. I think if you're starting a new job or if you're in your job and haven't Discuss, have discussions with the chief marketing officer, I think that's a great way to start because you can talk to them. This is my image. This is what I want to portray. These are the patients I want to capture. This is the professional role I want to play in academics. And they can actually help you with it. I mean, John has been instrumental with saying like, oh, Karen, you know, don't post your logo right next to ours. Or, you know, before anything starts, you can send some possibilities to your chief marketing officer. And then it starts to be a great symbiotic relationship rather than, oh, they won't let me post this or they, they took this down. So I think that's one way to start in your hospital. And then the second question somebody asked too is what exactly to post on these different um, platforms. And I think just like my brother was talking in advertising, you know, LinkedIn has a very professional um, feel to it. So you want to post um, something about your work or you're happy about your hospital versus um, Instagram is definitely more picturesque. And so you want to post something about, you know, here's us giving this talk right now. Um, these are the different slides we talked about, or I'm at this conference, um, look, this person speaking, give a shout out to somebody, try to um, be very humble with things, talk about yourself, but then invite others to the group. Um, and then Twitter has more kind of, let's discuss maybe a controversial topic or see what other people say. So it's kind of, I treat it a little bit like a game and try to learn something from each one. And, um, you know, last week I was dealing with an imposter on Instagram who tried to be me and people like, do I friend this person? Do I not? Um, so there's always things to learn, I think. Absolutely. No, I know I got a couple weeks ago, I got hacked and was selling Bitcoin. So, yeah. Don't <laughs> don't buy Bitcoin from me. I'll tell you right now. I'm not the guy you want to oh, buy. Oh, man, Bitcoin. Jordan, come on. I already exactly. bought a lot of um, So Karen, talk a little bit about... Um, some of the challenges around this. So I would say that e even if you looked at our at our question at the beginning in our poll, you know, seventy five percent of the people uh, said they they that that quote unquote promotion was viewed negatively. And I understand there's some branding and promotion, but it still carries a stigma. And so, so talk about, uh, and I think you and I and others have definitely dealt with the like being out there comes at a benefit. It also comes at a cost, and it's easier to just stay in the back back behind the curtain and not poke your head out, like Sri wants us to poke our head out, but it comes at a cost in medicine. Talk a little bit about that, your experience with that and how you've kind of got to a better place of that, or is it just putting your fingers in your ear and saying, la, 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 I'm not listening? I think one thing is since I'm more mid-level in my career um, or midway through my career, I can have a thicker skin. So I'm, I'm very happy to put things out there that I believe in and I support. Um, I, I think it, I think is it is a bit of an evolution as well. Whereas in the beginning, maybe you do want to be a little bit more neutral if you're not ready for some big hits coming your way. Um, you know, I remember posting something about um, rehab for an ACL reconstruction. All of a sudden, there was this group of people from another country who chimed in, and they had this huge stance on this, and it was going back and forth and. Um, you know, I guess we can ask John, but any PR is good PR, I guess. And I, I didn't even think the topic was controversial, but sometimes there are times when you want to block something, take something down. There's, there's certainly positive discussion that could happen, but if something starts going awry, that's where you just have control over it. And um, that's why you do have to man this every day. You have to look to see what's happening. You have to have, you know, our hospital puts feelers out in terms of like Google reviews and, and other things. They keep track of that. Um, you know, you'll tell me if somebody's an imposter on things. So um, I think keeping track of it. And then you know, I've always been taught bring your diversity to the table. And so if somebody doesn't like who I am or doesn't like what I'm doing, um, I do get that where, you know, people think I'm promoting myself or I've had even orthopedic surgeon women say, why are you wearing a dress and makeup all the time? Why, like, you know, but those are things that that's who I am. And, 
you know, to be unique in this space is, I think just as Shree was saying and Elliot was saying, to, to be unique and be who you are a bit is what is drawing patients to see me. There are times when I'll ask a patient, oh, why are you here, um, you know, for your daughter's ACL surgery? And she's like, oh, I didn't find you. She saw you on Instagram and said, wow, that doctor is the team doc for US, USA lacrosse. And she played lacrosse at Duke and she's going to do my surgery. So I've had patients drive up from New Jersey to have their surgery for me just based on Instagram. And so if I didn't kind of put that flair out there where I still work out, I do my triathlons with you and, um, and cover team USA and go over some of the bumps in the road that female athletes face. And, you know, it, you're going to be just kind of a one in a million. So you, you do have to, you do have to test the waters a bit. It's all great information. Um, and Karen, lastly, I'm going to ask you a little bit about um, some of the services that people use. And I know different people uh, in the orthopedic surgery world, I think use different services to kind of do social media on their behalf. And uh, some do a little bit, some do a lot bit. Um, and I think it's around this kind of authentic voice. Cause I always feel like I can always tell if it's like the person I know, if I, if I know them, like it's them saying something versus it's like a, a service saying something. They're very different. They feel very different. I was wondering just kind of your thoughts around that and how prevalent is, is that a discussion among you? You saw me ask the question in my poll. What's your thought on social media? It's like, I do it, but I don't like to talk about it. That was about <laughs> half the people. Um, so talk a little bit about the growth of that in your world, because it seems like, especially on the orthopedic surgery side, at least at our institution, almost every single person seems to have some kind of service doing some of this on their behalf. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it goes into, there's one where you could have a service that just puts your journal articles that you just published, and it could be just as simple of like, hey, I just have to get stuff out there. It's, it's automatic. They're not making any comments or, you know, writing any opinions. Um, but my choice, for example, is I do a mix of both. I, I have somebody who I hire to do blogs and I give him topics or, you know, when I was on the today show, I had him do a little synopsis of that. Um, and, and we work together for probably five years and eventually he's able to do more and more, but he can portray my voice and he kind of knows the spirit and the energy that I want to capture. Um, I think it's hard to do yourself. I mean, I, I think that you need content out there and there needs to be a way to get it out there. And so I do find blogging and putting um, content out there that way through this freelancer that I that I use is very helpful. Um, and some of the services, they tend to be, if you want to get more patients in there, you know, there's, um, you know, um, a lot of the WebMD, Doximetry, all of that stuff where you can be just more professional and say, here's who I am. This is what I'm doing and put up a, a flagpole um, on that on that case. But I personally think it's helpful to have somebody involved. I have a, you know, he writes two blogs a week and um, we try to get that out to Twitter and um, um, and LinkedIn. And I think that's been really useful because we're so busy these days and you can get really caught up in this. And, and one thing I've learned is not to like scroll around the whole time, put your stuff out there. And you need to have a time when you just put that computer, put that phone down because it does have a limitation to how much you really should spend time on it. Terrific. All right. I'm, I'm opening this up to questions um, and I've expanded the view on my side to the gallery view. Think Karen, thank you so much. We're going to go around the horn from our, our panel in the last five minutes or so as I look through some of the questions as well. John, we're going to start with you, who is our leadoff batter. Um, you've listened to these discussions. Uh, what strikes you about what you've heard around not only what you said, but what everybody else said as well? Well, I think there's an enormous amount of great advice and experience and wisdom. And just to, to pick up on three things that I think Karen just said that are super important. Um, and the, 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 in the words humility, integrity, and monitoring, which aren't really related. But when, as she was talking about brands, you know, the emphasis that she put on, on humility, and that's a key distinction in how consumers will read the difference between marketing or branding and, and promotion. Um, and it also makes you more um, empathetic. Um, also integrity. Karen didn't use that word, but she she referenced it. And it's it really is about being real and being authentic and taking a position, not not being, you know, 
unconstructively uh, uh, controversial, but 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 having values, and that was something that that Elliot mentioned before. Is you know what do you stand for, and um, and doing that with integrity. So uh, I think you know, and again, using Karen as an example, modeling um, and saying, look, this is who I am, this is what I do, makes her enormously helps potential future patients see who she is and just how she can understand what's important to them as athletes and, and therefore, you know, help them to achieve better outcomes. And the last piece, which is, is wickedly valuable, important advice is uh, again, Karen made the point about monitoring things and uh, it is breathtaking the number of physicians, possibly people who are on this call who haven't looked at their vitals or health grade profiles in years. And so often there, there, if there, there, there might be a, a completely misleading or false review that's out there. It's dangling out there and it's been out there for a long time. Never, ever, ever leave even a critical comment unanswered. And remember that when you're responding to those, you're not responding to the individual per se, you're responding to all of the observers of the conversation. It's an opportunity for you to demonstrate what your brand is. That is simple, easy, low hanging fruit. If nobody does anything else after this call, please go check that and, and respond to, to those. So I think humility, integrity, and monitoring three absolutely key pieces of advice. Wonderful. Sri, um, uh, and by the way, Sri put up in the chat a uh, Fundamentals of Social Media course on demand, two hour course. Um, you can take it uh, and you get a certificate afterwards from, is that from uh, certificate certified by Sri? Who get, where do we get that from? Oh, you're on mute. And from Muckrack, and uh, it's totally free. And uh, about 11,000 people around the world have taken it and they get a nice thing you can put online. I was just, I've learned so much from this conversation. And I think one of the things that we often think about with social is that it's about broadcasting all the time, but listening, checking what you're doing, as you just heard from John is so important and uh, seeing what others see, how patients look. Today, I was looking for uh, a doctor uh, for uh, in, on ZocDoc and just to see uh, you know, what's out there. And it's so striking how much everything from the image, from the little thumbnail to your description, how much that matters. It's not all just social media, but where anywhere people are talking about you, you have to, people have to know who you are and make sure your best accurate you is being represented. I think it's all great advice. I'm, I'm going to pick one question here at the bottom. How often are you posting general health or medical advice versus posting what you do in your general life? Um, and I think it's an interesting mix. Uh, and I, you know, I think that you know, picking up on Karen and John's comments around being accessible as a person, um, and and kind of talking about what is important to you is is very important. So, if, for example, if I want to promote, you know, preventive health and exercise and group and community, you know, I figure out different ways to think about that without, you know, hopefully without going overboard. My general rule is. What would my mother say if she saw this post? The mom, the mom filter is the way to think about it, I think. Um, and uh, if my mom, if it's okay with my mom, then I generally feel like it's, it's okay. Um, so Elliot, uh, listening to all this from your vantage point as physician and MBA, uh, what strikes you about this conversation? I, I appreciate it. Every, everybody's input. It's, it's great input, you know, but I think, you know, ultimately everybody's message is, is the same. It goes back to, to what you said, uh, Jordan, in the very, very beginning. You know, it's the service that you provide. Are you able to take care of patients or not? You know, if you are, then your brand is already there. It's just up to you to kind of build that brand. Um, and you have to be real to, in terms of, you know, what Karen was saying, real in terms of who you are. You have to stay to that. And then you just have to be careful. Um, I like Shree's push in terms of just go out there and do it. You know, it's you know, what I tell medical students and residents and fellows and even, you know, my colleagues as well who don't do it, I said, <clears throat> number one, medicine is becoming a business whether you like it or not. So you can either stay behind and get left behind or you can hop on the wagon and, and join in. It's the same thing with, with social media. It is going to be there with your branding whether you like it or not. And so you either do something about it or you're going to get left behind. 
Um, and, and I think that's the message that, that everybody was trying to give is that number one, you're still a physician, you're still a provider, you still have to provide excellent services, but now think about it in a way where it's a promise to your patient and how do you build on that? Um, and it's a huge opportunity for both the organization and yourself, um, as long as you stay true to yourself and stay true to your patients. And Karen, lastly, thoughts on uh, kind of this whole conversation, we've been for, we, this is an hour already of conversation around these topics. And it's interesting because, you know, doing, you know, doing an ACL surgery is something you kind of train X, Y, Z, you know, watch and watch and then do the tunnels and then do the graft and then do the full thing. And, you know, over time, do the whole thing yourself. But this is interesting because it's not, there's not a direct playbook and there's a lot of trial and error and there's a lot of stuff that's evolving over the time. And then you kind of sit back like, my God, I've been doing this stuff. I do have some experience in this and expertise in this, um, even though I didn't think I did along the way. What's, what's your impression around all this as, as you're kind of listening in? I think one thing is um, look at people that you want to emulate and see how they got there. I remember coming to HSS and um, you and I connected pretty quickly, but I had seen what you did on social media and I asked you, you know, who manages this and, and what happened. So again, taking a bite of humble pie where you look at other people and say, hey, I, I want to do what you're doing and, and how'd you get there? And I'm really impressed. So I think, you know, having forums like this and being able to discuss it because it's constantly evolving. I am, you know, not on TikTok. I'm on Snap just because my kids are there. So, you know, I can't be the perfectionist in all these different platforms. I need John and you to help me. Um, but, you know, and plus have fun with it, you know, just see what's out there. And you and I have posted some fun stuff with our rides and our events. And it, it honestly, it should have a fun flair to it. And um and I, I enjoy it personally. Terrific. Well, listen, we're, we've been an hour already. Um, John, Sri, Elliot, Karen, everybody who uh, joined us from all over the country. Uh, we really appreciate you. We appreciate uh, the AMSSM for allowing us to put on this program. And this will be watched by many more people uh, on demand. And so uh, for all of you people in the future who will watch this, we appreciate you as well. And um, just appreciate everybody's terrific comments as we see these comments coming in in the chat. Um, and we look forward to seeing you online. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, we will see you on the road. All right. Great Thanks job, everyone. Jordan. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye.